This week, uh, I have the pleasure of introducing one of our most uh, recent uh, Mises Fellows, Gilbert Marima. Uh, Gilbert is from Kenya, Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, he has uh, received his MBA degree and his Master's in Economics at Alabama A&M. He is now here at Auburn University as a Mises Fellow and working on his Ph.D. in Economics. Uh, Gilbert is going to be talking to, to us today about socialists in Africa and how they're destroying the economy over there. So, Gilbert, take it away. Thank you. I'm sure all of you have your schedules, and um, today was supposed to be somebody else speaking. And uh, like he's introduced me, my name is Gilbert Warema, and I'll be talking about the socialists that destroyed Africa. Uh, the history of Africa can be told in many ways. Uh, first, we can we talk about prehistoric uh, uh, pre prehistory of Africa. I mean, of the world, and usually it starts with Africa. And then we talk about ancient civilization when you talk where, where you talk about Egypt and all that. And then after ancient civilization, you talk about the different kingdoms that uh, existed in Africa at a certain time. And then you come to the uh, period of slavery and then period of colonialism. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about the period of colonialism, which actually shapes up Africa as it, as it is today, as we all know it today. Um, when the colonialists sat in Belgium in the 1890s and deci decided to partition Africa, um, different countries in Europe took different parts of Africa as colonies. Uh, and eventually Africa was divided up into French colonies, British colonies, and uh, Portuguese colonies, and a little bit of uh, uh, Spanish colonies. Uh, today, Africa is divided up into basically two, you know, uh, French, the Francophone Africa and the Anglophone Africa. But um, the objectives of the colonialists really was to enhance their economies back in Europe. And what they did was they, used, they were using the colonies as a way to get their uh, raw materials and cheap labor so that they could feed their industries in Europe. And when doing that, what they did when they came to Africa was to be able to give the African people, the natives that existed in those colonies, a very, very basic education that was to enable them to work, you know, with them, to be able to communicate with them in English, French, Portuguese, or whatever, and for them to be able to carry out their economic uh, activities as, as it were in Africa. So, Africa today really is shaped by the way the colonialists treated the Africans at that particular time. And come the time of independence, the Africans wanted to rebel against that, to come up with their own economic development policies that were geared towards the Africans, as opposed to the colonialist policies that were geared towards um, uh, Europe. So the most compelling need for de development planning in the eyes of African leaders was Africa's colonial legacy. The colonial objectives were not to develop Africa, but to undertake only forms of development that were compatible with the interests of European metropolitan powers. Since they were mostly industrialized, the, col uh, the colonies were envisaged to function as non-industrial appendages of the metropolitan economies. Consumers of European manufacture, manufactured goods and providers of mineral, agricultural and wood commodities. As a result, development of the colonial economies was perniciously skewed, over-specialized in one or two main cash crops, making African economies highly vulnerable to commodity um, cash crop commodities in the world market. Specialization in cash crops, it was argued, also destroyed the Africa's ability to feed its people and supply their other need internally. 
Most domestic industries collapsed from competition from cheap and probably cheaper imported manufacturers because of collusion of foreign farms and discrimination from colonial banks. The modern sector was completely in foreign hands. Thus, most of the surplus profit generated by the economy flowed overseas and not reinvested back into the colonies. Local industrialization was flatly discouraged. The prime motivating force behind colonialism was exploitation, not social development. Infrastructural facilities provided by the colonialists was pitiful. Only a few roads, hospitals, schools, and schools were built. As Kwame Nkrumah, the first president of Ghana, uh, said, under colonial rule, foreign monopoly interest, interest had tied our whole economy to suit, them, to suit themselves. We had not a single industry. Our economy depended on one cash crop, that is Ghana. The Ghana's economy depended on only one cash crop, that was cocoa. Although our output of cocoa is the largest in the world, there was not a single cocoa processing plant in Ghana. There was no direct rail link between Accra and Takoradi. These are the two main cities in Ghana. There were few schools, hospitals, and clinics. Most villages lacked piped water supply. In fact, the nakedness of the land when my government began in 1951 had to be, to be experienced to be believed. That is what Nkrumah's view of what the colonialists had done in Ghana. But to show the example of what the, how the colonialists had neglected Africa, we take an example from Tanzania at the time of independence. In 1961, at the independent, during the, when Tanzania got independence from the British, the infant mortality uh, was 225 uh, births, live births to 1,000. In 1967, that was after independence, and this was after the Tanzanian government had taken over, the infant mortality dropped to 161 to 1,000 live births. In 1978, it went down to 152 to 1,000 live births, and in 1984, it was 137 which shows that the infant mortality was dropping because, again, it shows that the, the government, the, the Tanzanian government was trying to see that uh, they eradicated this kind of thing that happened during the colonialist period. The crude, rate, uh, crude death rate in 1967 was 22 to 1,000, and in 1982 it had fallen down to 13 to 1,000. The life expectancy rate in 1962 was 35, and in 1984 it had risen to 56. Um, literacy rate in 1962 was 35 percent, but in 1984 it had risen to 85 percent. I have a slight uh, doubt about that figure, 85 percent, but um, <laughs> that's what it says. Uh, professionals. In 1961, there were only 12 doctors in a country of 15 million people. But in 1982, that had risen to 1,200 doctors. Uh, in 1961, it was one doctor to about 870,000 870, people. In 1962, uh, the number had risen to 1,200 doctors, or one doctor to 26,000 people. Still a very bad rate, but are nevertheless some improvement. In education, uh, in 1961, there were only two university graduates in Tanzania. Two university graduates. That is apart from the, doc the doctors. Uh, in 1982, Tanzania has, was producing 5,000 university graduates a year. Uh, in 1961, the number of primary uh, uh, 
the number of uh, kids that were in primary schools was 500,000, but in 1977 it had risen to 2 million people, uh, kids. As Tigno puts, puts in, in his book, The Colonial Transformation of Kenya, about, uh, he's talking about education in, in colonial Kenya, he says, colonial educators believe that Africans should be trained mainly for subordinate roles as clerks, teachers, evangelists, artisans, and always working under European supervision. An important factor justifying and rationalizing the transformation of European ideas and institutions in Africa was racism, which all European groups, administrators, missionaries, and, and settlers and settlers espoused. Because Europeans believed Africans were inferior, being as well um, if inferior beings as well as inefficient laborers, they felt justified to give them wage that no European would accept. Missionaries and other educators argued that the present stage of African development, the least form of education was one that stressed manual skills and did not provide much advanced literary learning. So this, this is the way the Africans saw um, that the colon what the colonialists were doing to the colonies at that particular time. So come the time of independence, African leaders that were spearheading the liberation movements across Africa, spearheaded by Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana, because Ghana was the first um, African independent nation, and uh, Julius Nyerere of Tanzania vowed to, miser uh, to demolish the miserable, distorted colonial economic structure in Africa that Africa had in inherited and erect in its place alternatives that would serve the needs and the interests of Africa, not those of Europe. To accomplish this, Africans would not rely on markets, which in the case were introduced by colonialists, and as such constituted decaying relics of old colonial order. True, African development required a carefully planned massive transformation of African economies. Such an investment could only be undertaken by the state. So you can see where they are coming from, and um, you can see they are already talk talking of the state. Uh, furthermore, transformation of African societies required state control of the economy. This set stage for massive state intervention in, late, in the late 1950s and in the, in the 1960s in Africa. That's when Africa was becoming independent. And um, you can see they're moving from colonialism to, uh, to statism that uh, involved a lot of state intervention. The U.S. aid, the World Bank, the U.S. State Department, development experts from Harvard and other big institutions in the United States supported this way, this as the way out for Africa. So you can see the United States was supporting uh, state intervention and all that. To initiate development, it was widely held that African states needed wide-ranging powers to marshal resources from the rural areas and channel them into national development. Extensive powers were conferred upon heads of state, um, heads of state by rubber stamps parliament. And in fact, at one time, the president of Ivory Coast, um, who was uh, Hofwed, uh, Felix Hofwed Bounier, said, that in Ivory Coast, there is no number one, number two, or number three. I am the absol absolute power, which means the leaders assumed ex uh, you know, extreme powers to be able to lead these countries. Other heads of state simply arrogated unto themselves these powers. The ones that were not given by the parliaments, they decided they were going to take it themselves. A piece of land that was needed for highway construction was simply appropriated by the state, and if an enterprise was needed by the state, the government started it without consulting the people. This drift towards state intervention was accentuated by the socialist ideology. At independence, many African elites and intellectuals argued for an ideology to guide the government on the road to development. 
the choice almost everywhere was socialism. A wave of socialism uh, swept across the continent as almost all new African leaders succumbed to the contagious ideology. The proliferation of socialist ideologies that emerged in Africa ranged from Ujamaa, that is familyhood in Tanzania, Marxism, some of them were just had crazy names, Marxism, Christian socialism, humanitarianism, and negritude of Leopold Seda Senghor of Senegal, humanism of um, Kenneth Kaunda of Zambia, scientific socialism of Marin Gwabi of Congo, Arab Islamic Jamharia of um, Colonel Muammar Gaddafi in Libya, concessionism of Kwame Nkrumah in Ghana, and Mobutuism uh, in Zaire. Only a few African countries, uh, notably Kenya, Nigeria, Ivory Coast, were pragmatic enough not to accept socialism doctrine in the countries. Planned socialist transformation of African institution um, gave these African leaders power to control. All unoccupied lands was appropriated by the government. Roadblocks, passbook systems were employed to control movement of Africans. Marketing boards and ex export regulations were tightened to fleece cash crop producers. Price controls were imposed on peasant farmers and traders to render food cheap for the urban elites. Under Sekotures Guinea, who had uh, his own brand of socialism, which was called Marxism in African clothes. Whatever that means. <laughs> it said, unauthorized trading became a crime. Police roadblocks were set up around the country to control internal trade. This, the state set up monopoly of foreign trade and smuggling became punishable by death. Currency trafficking was punishable by 15 to 20 years in prison. Many farms were forced, farmers were forced to deliver annual harvest quarters to local revolutionary powers. State companies monopolized industrial production, and this was given in the New York Times in December 1987. Under Kwame Nkrumah's socialism, a bewildering array of legislative controls and regulations was imposed on import tariffs, uh, uh, capital transfer, industry, minimum wage, the rights and powers of trade unions, price, rent, and interest rates. Some of the controls were introduced by colonialists, but they were retained and expanded by Nkrumah. Nkrumah was the same person who became to power, decided that he was going to break everything that the colonialists had done to the African people. But you, as you can see, he retained some of those things. Private businesses were taken over and nationalized. Numerous state enterprises were acquired. Even in the vaudly capitalist countries like Ivory Coast and Kenya, the result became the same. Government ownership of enterprises and the distrust of private sector initiatives and foreign investment, you know, they were all under the government, uh, government ownership. And that's why I always call Kenya's capitalism as pseudo-capitalism, because it is socialism in other words. Under statism, African government envisioned huge surpluses in the rural sector to be tapped for development. Large resources could be transferred to the, um, to the state by extracting wealth from the peasant producers. The milking devices used included poll taxes, low producer prices, export marketing boards, hidden export taxes, price <coughs> controls, development levies, forcing peasant farmers to sell annual quotas to the government organizations. The assumption was that when such resources were, re were ceded to the state, they will be used by the f development planners to benefit all in the country. The, pe the prizes peasants received were dictated by African governments, not as determined by the market forces in accordance with African traditions. Under a system of price controls, African peasants came to pay the world's most 
confiscatory taxes. They forced, uh, they were forced steep uh, penalties and outright confiscation of their produce if they sold at the above control prices. Um, the markets were burned down and destroyed in Accra, Ghana, and other cities when traders refused to sell, to sell at government dictated prices. In 1982, the Tamale Central Market was set ablaze, causing destruction of huge amounts of food and drugs and imported spare parts. This was given in the West African magazine in 1982. Unbelievable brutalities were heaped upon peasant farmers and traders under Ghana's price control. In 1983, for example, Ghanaian cocoa farmers were paid 10% of the world market prices for their produce. In Gambia, peasant farmers received about 20% of their produce. The West Africa magazine puts it this way. On average, between 1964 and 1985, the, the peasant, peasants of Gambia were robbed 60% of their international price for their ground nuts. For 20 years, the Dauda Jawara government officially took free of charge three out of five, uh, five bags, that's five bags leaving the peasant with a gross of two. With deduction of subsistence credit, fertilizers, seeds, etc., the peasant will end up with net one bag out of five. With this fact, it's simply Wrong to say that poverty of peasants derives from the defects of nature, drought, um, overpopulation, laziness, and so on. And this is the, what the African governments kept on telling their people, you know, we are getting overpopulated. Oh, there's a lot of drought, you know, you are lazy, you're not producing. Yet it was a simple thing as price. In Zambia, when traders refused to sell their produce at the government dictated prices, Authorities raided markets in May 1988. They arrested hundreds of people, took their money, and tore down market stalls. Peasantry was systematically robbed of considerable, considerable resources. These resources, instead of going to develop the, the country as the leaders had, had um, said before, they were used by the elite majority to develop urban areas for themselves. For example, 80% of Ivory Coast's development was centered around Abidjan, the capital, for the benefits of the urban elite, not the rural peasants. The standards of living enjoyed by the elites far outstripped those of the peasants. Let me read you a small quote over here. Well, in contrast to the plush and subsidized amenities of the ruling class in the urban areas, with the dingy and wretched, uh, with the dingy and wretched lives of the rural peasants, in Mauritania, for example, while the elites, the Arabs, had access to subsidized tap water supplies, the peasant of often black paid seven to forty times more for their water from sellers with donkey carts. In 1982, while the leadership in Zaire was making between $5,000 to $9,000 a month, a peasant was lucky to make $50 a month. This was given in Africa now in March 1982. In 1985, Cameroon, with a per capita income of less than $1,000 a year, was the world's largest importer of champagne. The elites were living high. The governor of the Dakar-based Africa Central Bank can reach his 13th floor office without having to step out of his car, one of the many parks that go with the region's highest paying jobs is a, you know, a private lift, lift or elevator to hoist him and his Mercedes to work. That is... <laughs> his elevator lifted the car? <laughs> Yeah, yeah you just drive in and uh, you go. <laughs> but despite all this, this uh, the, the African leaders kept on saying, only socialism will save Africa. African leaders and nationalists chanted. But the nationalist uh, socialism practiced in Africa was a peculiar one. 
It was what they call the Swiss Bank Socialism, which allowed the heads of uh, heads and phalanx of kleptocrats, these are uh, armed government armed government looters, to rape and plunder African treasuries for deposits in Switzerland. As African economies deteriorated, Africa's tyrants and elite cohorts furiously developed pot bellies and chins at the rate commensurate with the economic decline. While African peasants were being exhort, exhorted to tighten their belts, vampire elites were loosening theirs with fat bank balances overseas. Um, so, and the Le Monde, that uh, newspaper in uh, France, put it this way. Every franc that we give impoverished Africa come back to Europe, uh, to France, or is smuggled into Switzerland or Japan. Something like that. So, as you can see, they kept on saying only socialism will save Africa, but uh, on the other hand, they kept on doing other things behind the people's backs. Okay, uh, okay. Got a lot more there, though. <laughs> yeah, it seems like. Well, let, let me get back. Let me get to the to the result of all this. the The result of all this is that between 1980 and 1965 and 1986, Africa's GNP grew at a deplorable. 0.9 percent. Population, on the other hand, uh, grew at 3 percent, which meant that there was a decline in economic welfare. Uh, the real per capita income dropped by 14.6 percent between 1986, uh, 1965 and 1986. Agricultural growth was negligible, 1.5 percent since 1970, and which because it could not keep up with the growth in population explosion. Net foreign investment declined between 1965 and 1985 from 2,400,000 uh, 2, in 1965 to 1.5 billion in 1985. Uh, in 1990, Sub-Saharan Africa, with a population of 400 billion people, had a gross domestic product of 135 billion, which equals that one of Belgium, which has a population of 10 million people. Income per capita fell from 621, 621 in 1981 to 352 in 1987. This is a doom-gloom kind of picture that uh, Africa has. But there were a few exceptions in Africa. There were a few success, success stories, uh, notably uh, Botswana, Mauritius, Cameroon, Senegal, and Gabon. My own homeland, Kenya, and Ivory Coast used to belong in this well-to-do group, but um, lately they've been having economic problems and we cannot put them in that group. The worst performers in Africa were... Uh, countries like Ethiopia, Ghana, Zaire, Liberia, Sudan, Uganda, Zambia, Somalia, and all these have something in common. Most of them, because of the socialist policies that some of their governments had had followed, they decided, you know, any, any fool could come in and say, these guys are taking too much from us. Let's topple them. So you have... Um, young captains in the army that are taking over in places like Sierra Leone and now they don't know what to do with the economy and they came into power <coughs> with people giving them support because they said there was a lot of corruption and yet they are corrupt themselves um, to sum it up the, the problems of Africa there is one housewife in Zaire who put it this way he says, to solve Zaire's economic uh, crisis, Amina Ramadou, a peasant housewife, suggested, let's send three sacks of angry bees to the governor and the president, and some ants which bite. 
Maybe they'll eat the government and solve our problems. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what happens is the people, the people in Africa are angry. But what has happened is um, Africa has been looking for, searching for answers. Even the so- so-called socialists that we are talking about today, some of them had very good intentions. Uh, President Nyerere, when he, he had the Arusha declaration to turn so- Tanzania into socialism, his intentions were good. He, was, he had a very good heart and everything for the people. It was socialism, which seemed to appeal to the masses. And um, some of them took and wanted to make it work, but it didn't work. Some of them used to, to their own advantage. But now we are in the 90s. We have learned... Uh, we have learned from our mistakes in the past, and Africa is going through another phase altogether. The phase that we are going through now is for a reform, you know, market, free markets and uh, democracy. I hope that this is going to, ha- I mean, this is going to work, and I'm, I know I'm right because when I see to the success stories that are coming out from Gaberon in Botswana. I'm very encouraged. When I look at Libreville, Gabon, and I see the economic successes, I'm very happy. When I see a country that was very poor, like Mauritius just recently, and the reforms that they have come up with, and they're doing very well, I'm very encouraged. When I look at the the longest surviving democracy in Africa in Senegal, and I see the economic successes that they've had over the period of time, I'm very encouraged when I look into Yaoundé in Cameroon and I see the kind of successes that they've had, I am very encouraged. And I know I'm right that Africa is finally in the right direction. And we need our friends in the West and everybody, everywhere else that uh, think Africa has finally arrived to help, our, to help us in this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. Any uh, questions? Yeah, I, I, I have a question, um, uh, a, a kind of a basic question about colonialism, because that's something that we're really, we don't really study. The only time we're really exposed to colonialism here is when we talk about um, British colonialism of, of, mm-hmm. uh, of the states. And um, so that's really our only exposure to it. Of course, we revolted against that as well. Um, it's, it's really not the case that the colonialism is free market com- companies coming in and setting up shop. It's, it's more, isn't it more along the lines of the uh, British slave trading monopolies and that, and that sort of thing where they're sort of pseudo-government uh, companies or yeah, monopolies? Yeah, when you, when, when you look at it from um, the, the colonialist perspective, when you look at it from, say, the British perspective, it all looks very good because it's it's all uh, British oriented. British is a capitalist economy and all that, and they transform that into into Africa. But when you look at it, it's that um, as as it is with all of us, we are selfish human beings, and um, we want to make the best for ourselves. So when when you look at it from the British perspective you see that it was something that looked like it, it was workable. In, in other places they say, well, the natives were always fighting themselves and uh, we came and gave them peace and uh, gave them religion and, we, <laughs> you know, and everything was good. But when you look at it from the African perspective, um, you see where the, the skewness that they are talking about came in. Mm-hmm. You find that... Um, like in education, and right to today, the people that are in government, like in Kenya, are those ones that were educated just to be able to be cooks and drivers and clerks. Those are the ones that are running Kenya, and that is what angered the Africans at that particular time. But uh, in, and as you can see, the ones that kept kept the 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 capitalist system that had been brought into the colonies seemed to be doing very well. That is the Kenyas, the Ivory Coast, the Botswanas, and all that. 
But those ones who started experimenting with something else, then there was a problem. Well, they were importing socialism from British universities and American universities, right? Yes. Like Nyerere studied in, in Scotland, and that's where he got his socialism from. Nkuruma studied in uh, England, and that's where he got his uh, socialism from. Yeah, it sounds like Robert Reich would have loved this. Set up his own university. Dr. Yeah. Porn, are you arguing that uh, the, um, the foreign investment under uh, the colony system is really government direct? Well, I'm I'm not sure, but I mean that that that's that's what I would you know I'm only familiar with British colonialism in the United States and British slave trading monopolies, uh, and they were uh, they were really you know government monopolies, and uh, it was kind of like privatized government arms reaching into these places Actually, that's, to do that's what it was. you know it, they were too, the slave trading monopolies were too far away to, for governments to manage. And so they sort of privatized them yeah. and gave them armies or, or, you know, military arms. And so they weren't really, you know, it's not like IBM or something like that. Um, uh, or Hardee's, it's more, it's, it's something, something entirely different. It's, uh, <laughs> I was going to say, I'm much more familiar with the 19th century colonial war than the 20th century, but uh, I'd argue that it wasn't even good for the, it wasn't good for the people of the colonial powers either. Mm -hmm. But in, say, England, I mean, the average... Britain was being taxed heavily to pay for the colonies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The British government was doing well from it. Special interests that were getting these monopoly contracts were mm -hmm. doing well. Um, and they had to sell it by religion and similar kinds of things, sell it to the, the European, the average taxpayer in Europe, mm -hmm. as uh, uplift and so forth. Once actually it was a ripoff, mm -hmm. like, uh, like everything else, the government's <laughs> ripoff. And, and, uh, um, so, even the countries that took over, you know, some of these uh, capitalist enterprises, they weren't really free market. Yeah. They weren't free market institutions. They were these guided special interests. Actually, that's, what, that's why the British formed, um, gave Kenya parara status. That's what has been crippling Kenya all this time, because they were quasi-government, mm -hmm. uh, like the post office. So if you have many of them, you can imagine. <laughs> Paul, uh, Gilbert, do you think that uh, from from your from looking at uh, the history and current events, that there's any overt freedom movement uh, for fomenting in Africa right now, or do you think it's more like a, a gut reaction saying, uh, I don't like these government officials telling me that I have to give them three bags of grain or whatever? Yeah, it's it's, it's like. Uh, Roger Garrison would say, you know, you, you do, a peasant farmer does not have to be an economist to know that he's being robbed. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's just the same way uh, as they did in Kenya. I used to see farmers cutting down their coffee trees because they were not being paid on time, and when they were paid, it was not up to par to what, whatever they expected, and they would cut down their coffee trees. So... And that's why there, there's, uh, there's been a decline in, um, you know, in agriculture in Africa. And that's why Africa cannot feed itself anymore. <clears throat> Colin Clark, the fourth, who was, are you familiar with him? Colin Clark, a British authority on agriculture, uh, wrote some material. It was on, on the general thing of world population. Mm -hmm. And he, presented marvelous figures about what excellent farmers there were in Africa, mm -hmm. and that it was only socialism that uh, undercut their productivity. Yeah. They can they had, that they had increased production after World War II, 15 percent per population, you know. Mm -hmm. They can really produce when they, they, they want to, because I, I, I've seen it in Kenya, the, the corn farmers, mm -hmm. uh, when they were not restricted, they, they produced so much that Kenya started exporting to African countries. Mm -hmm. Then when they formed those marketing boards, they, they de it declined immediately. Uh, last night on television, Pat Robinson was interviewing the president of Zambia. Yeah. And uh, he was very optimistic and very devoted to the market economy. And he thought that the direction of uh, economic affairs in Zambia was very promising. Well, um, I, Mr. Chiluba 
the president of Zambia is um, is a very good Christian, and I think that's as far as it goes, because <laughs> <laughs> he has surrounded himself with uh, a bunch of corrupt people. Like I was telling her, you know, and uh, and Dr. Thompson, is that at one particular time, three government officials. Uh, foreign aid came into the country and they sat together and they decided you take this, let me take this and, and Chiluba did absolutely nothing and his government is just corrupt They, some of them have been you know, the foreign minister has been exporting um, narcotics in diplomatic bags and Chiluba has done nothing about that because they put him into power so he's a good man but um, the wrong person sounds like a big idiot yeah, he's a figurehead Yes, sir. I find, um, just given the figures that you've given, that is an interesting dichotomy going on because for the last 30 years, where well, you see all these all these countries have tried the socialist practices, and they're slowly but surely starting to move into the right direction as far as trying to develop democracies and free market economies. And here we are in the United States with probably the greatest democracy and free market economy in the world, and we have forces in our government that are trying to take it towards socialism. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> it's like, like they say in the Bible, the first shall be last. <laughs> Very soon you'll be looking up to me. <laughs> uh, you, you know, on, on that point, um, uh, Jimmy Rogers, the uh, famous investor from Alabama, in his book Investment Biker, and he took a motorcycle tour of the whole world and set the world record for land travel. Uh, and one of the places he drove through was Africa. And he said uh, that uh, investments in Africa are going to, sometime in the near future, going to re- provide the highest returns in terms of yeah. stocks. And he specifically mentioned Botswana. He said that you, uh, Americans can't invest there right now, but he said eventually it's going to be um, one of the highest uh, – Growth areas, boom type areas in the world. So there, you know, there is uh, is some hope. Why can't they invest? Well, no stock markets, or you know, it's, you just can't call up your broker and say, "Buy me a hundred shares." Of, no mechanism. Yeah, there's no, no mechanism. Yeah, it's still in the in the infancy stage. Um, the stock markets that exist right now, are in, the, the biggest one is in Johannesburg. And uh, the rest of them have been set up in Nairobi, in, uh, in Abidjan, in uh, Mauritius, in uh, Gaberon, in Botswana, in Zambia, and uh, in Lagos. And um, many more are being set up right now, but they're, they're very, very small. They're still at their infancy stages. But like you said, Botswana is a place for you to look. It's um, Along those lines... When they, <coughs> when most of these governments institute socialist policies, was one of their first reactions to uh, sort of restrict capital controls and restrict uh, import uh, capital coming in and capital leaving, and and if so, are they making any kind of movements to? You're saying it's, uh, stock markets being sort of an infancy stage. Is that been one of the main movements to try to let capital come in and, and increase the flow of investment? You see, the, the thing that flowed a country like Kenya was uh, the fact that uh, they they restricted incoming investment. I mean, people around the world are looking at Kenya as uh, an example for Africa, but they they restricted the incoming you know capital flow. But what is happening right now um, is that uh, the Kenya the Nairobi Stock Exchange has been opened up. To foreign investments, and that's the movement that is going on all over Africa. That's that's why I, I'm kind of optimistic right now. The um, one of the big stories um, of the previous decade was all the droughts in Ethiopia and all the you know massive famine and death and that sort of thing, and the worldwide efforts to um, help solve those droughts. But you, you suggested that it was um, that it wasn't drought, and and I, I read one article that said that, you know, in Ethiopia where the drought was going on, uh, they were starving to death, but in Kenya, they had the same drought, and yet 
No, no. They were not, and that those patterns of drought had been going on in Africa forever, and uh, it was just this time that there was a big problem. Yeah, in Ethiopia, they, uh, during the, the government of Mengis to Meriam, of course, he was, he was a communist. What he did was um, he had what they called a, a sand scorch policy or something like that. What he did was um, the certain people in certain parts of Ethiopia that were opposed to him. So what he did was uh, he said he stood to burn all the crops. You know, so famine was there. You know, the drought was there, all right. But if you're going to, again, destroy the little that you have, then there's a big problem. And when relief aid was coming in, they stopped it from going to the places that were really affected because those, the, same, the places that were affected were the ones that were opposed to him. So many people died more than they should have died because of the government policies. I mean, when you look at, at that particular time, yes, it was in around 1984, Kenya had the drought also. Somalia had the drought. Somalia is drier than both Kenya and Ethiopia, but Somalia had never had any kind of drought, I mean, food shortages before. That tells you that um, at that particular time, the, the government let the people feed themselves, and they were feeding themselves. Somalia gets into this problem now because of warlords and all of that. And, uh, yes, sir. Oh, I was just going to say that uh, President Bush going into Somalia succeeded in destroying, putting out of business every farmer in Somalia and all the markets because they brought in free food. Yeah, mm -hmm. they, they brought in And so free food. the farmers could, of course, stay in business. In Badera, so I think. Wrecked, it, they wrecked the indigenous yeah, they, they, cultural. Uh, there are certain areas that, um, you know, the, the, the people had already begun to feed themselves. But when this one came in, you know, who was going to spend a lot of time trying to... But all the, the, the problem of Ethiopia, the problem of um, Somalia, the problem of what is going on in Zaire today, uh, and Angola and Mozambique, also had the U.S. playing a little bit, you know, a part in it. And um, in Angola, of course, they were supporting Zavimbi. That, like, he's a terrible man. Uh, in in Zam, I mean, in Zaire, they were supporting Mobutu, who is richer than the country. <laughs> I mean, he he he, gives, <laughs> he lends his country money, <laughs> and um, uh, right now, Zaire is grounding to a halt economically. What? what I'd like to hear more about Savimbi. Savimbi. Um, was fighting communism, as it is. Because um, when Angola became independent, um, Dos Santos... No, 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 it was um, the, the other guy. Um, Neto. Uh, yeah, Agostino Neto was uh, the president then, and he was a Marxist. So uh, Savimbi came to the West and said, look, we have to fight these communists. And um, the U.S. started supporting him. Even Bush said it to himself, you know, we've been giving this guy a lot of money to fight the communists. But um, he's going around maiming his own people, killing people he's going to rule tomorrow. I mean, cutting their limbs and, and all that. How about all this international development aid um, that's been going into Africa uh, for the last several decades from the World Bank and, and all that. Is that uh, had any positive effect or, you know... Uh... It, has, it has had some, you know, some sort of uh, success in some places and in many, many places it has not. Especially when you're going to prop up a dictator like Moi in Kenya and give him money when the U.S. and the rest of the nations in the world decided they were not going to give Kenya aid anymore, he panicked. You know, he was like, where are we getting, where are we going to get the money anymore? Because African countries have sort of like relied on this aid to an extent that um, 
it's come, you know, this amount is coming from this place, this amount is coming from the other place. So we don't have to work hard, we, have, we don't have to tighten our belts and uh, do with the, the small budget that we have. Rather, we have to wait for... And then when you get it from the World Bank or the International Monetary Fund, they come up with their, you know, their structural, structural adjustment programs, which are all very Keynesian, and uh, mm-hmm. they help destroy you even more. So it's not building up. It does not build Company up. The, the part that I left, I was going to talk about debt and um, to show you how it's really affecting Africa today. Is there a large debt? Huh? Is there a large debt like in Latin America? Well, if I say two, uh, to $300 billion to America, it might seem very small. But to poor nations of Africa, that's too much. You know, it's twice the gross domestic product of Africa in a year. So. May I ask a question? Was there any noticeable change in the countries and Marxism in the countries when the Soviet Union collapsed, or was that negligible? Not important. That's that's what is uh, sweeping across Africa today. I mean, it, it I really. Mean, were they actually promoting? Was the Soviet Union actually aiding and abetting? Yes, the they Soviet were. Union. They were there in Ethiopia. I mean, I know. they had the they they had their base in Ethiopia. I mean, they. Why in Ethiopia? Like yes, they were in uh, Mozambique. Uh, they were there in Angola, and uh, with, with, of course, with the Cubans in Angola, and um, they were actively supporting all the socialist uh, governments in Africa. Uh, they did it in Tanzania. The Chinese helped Tanzania a lot, and um, all over when where there was sort of a sort of a Marxist state like in Guinea and all those places. They were there helping them. And that has ceased. That ceased, you know, immediately. First of all they can't afford it, so they couldn't afford it. The the Pew success stories you talked about, um, yeah. is it sort of a matter of degree they're so much less socialistic than the others? Or is it is it a fundamental commitment over the long haul to, to market liberalism? Um, yes, some of them it's a it's really a, a long run objective. Uh, Botswana from 1965 has just gone one way. You know they've never looked back. They've always been very democratic. They've very they've been market oriented. And they've worked very hard towards it. Senegal, the same thing. They've worked very hard towards it. Uh, Gabon, they're blessed with uh, a huge reserve of oil. That's why. But they, they, they're sort of also very market oriented. The same thing with, to some degree, Cameroon. But Cameroon has been, um, uh, it's, it has been a success story. But it has also been plagued by the fact that they have a considerable amount of um, government parastatals and a little bit of control from France. So that's what it's like. So it's a long-term policy. Kenya would have been like that, but they left a window of, uh, of, of the leaders to play with in terms of uh, government parastatals and all that, and they really used it. You know the present government, you know the present government and present president has really used that, putting people from his tribe in all the positions and whether they are qualified for it or not. And for example, when I worked at Kenya Airways, which is a government parasol, which which is being privatized right now, at one Christmas party, uh, the the general manager of administration. One of the top guys, you can say vice president administration, was giving a speech. And I couldn't believe what he said. I really did not believe. I knew there was a lot of uh, corruption and uh, mismanagement, but I didn't think it was they knew what they were doing. The guy says, um, you know, what we should do is we, we are all eating. 
you know, from this company. So when, when we are taking from the company, let's take, but don't take too much so that we, tomorrow we, the company can continue operating. <laughs> I did. <laughs> I seriously did not believe my ears that, that this is one of the people that Moi put there. And what could you say? An honest crook. Honest crook. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any movement to combine countries at all in any kind of policies and trade within Africa? Yes, and uh, it's becoming a problem already because I was reading the the OAU, the Organization of African Unity, is trying to form a common market in Africa. But um, what is happening is in the West you have a, you know economic community for West Africa. In Central Western Africa you have the UDAC. Uh, in Eastern Africa, you have uh, COMESA, which is the uh, economic community for Eastern and Southern Africa. And then within the Southern Africa region, Central and Southern Africa region, you have uh, SADC countries, and then you have SACU and, and all that. And then in, in East Africa, which comprises of Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, they used to have what they call the East African community, and they've recently revived it. Now, I was reading that um, there's a problem. Of where do I belong or where do I go? Which one do I have more affiliation with? So the Af Southern African countries are pulling more to the south so that they can align themselves with, um, with South Africa. <coughs> the countries to the Eastern Africa region are trying to pull so that they can align themselves with Kenya because of the, the two are seen to be uh, economically powerful. <coughs> But then there's a problem. There's a study recently says that uh, most of the, those African countries produce basically the same things. So if I'm producing shirts, how can I trade with Peter who's producing shirts? I can only trade with him because he's Calvin Klein and he's producing. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a problem. It's all meant to increase trade amongst each amongst African countries, but um, I don't know how that one is going to happen. Yeah, we're on a related question, um, isn't it the case that many of the national boundaries are artificially drawn or created during the colonial period? Is there any movement <coughs> towards redrawing national boundaries to correspond with, you know, ethnic, ethnic the location of different ethnic groups as there is in Europe? Well, they, they could be that, but Africa has so, so many ethnic groups. So, so many. Unless you want to have a country like the size of Auburn University. I mean, they, <laughs> then you can do that. Otherwise, it's, it's almost impossible. It, it's creating a lot of problems. When I was at home one time, the Maasai herdsmen in Tanzania, because they are both places, were grazing their cows and caused it to Kenya. There is no marking that says Kenya and Tanzania. They don't know that. And they were being prosecuted in court. The poor people did not know what, what was going on. And they were sentenced to two months in jail. I, it really <laughs> upset me because these are people who have been in this... This is their ancestral land. They don't know what political boundaries are. But they're being prosecuted, and I'm sure they didn't know what is the big deal, you know. So it's a big problem, but uh, it's a problem that I don't know how it's going to be solved. Well, maybe you can come back uh, next quarter, and uh, I've got a lot more questions on South Africa and the environmentalists and all that kind of stuff, so maybe you can come back and give us an update uh, sometime in the future. Okay, I'll talk to you. Thank you very much. Thank you.